First, I want to welcome you and thank you all for coming out to this marvelous new uh, event location for Maui. And we want to give a big shout out and thank you to the Maui Ocean Center. They charge money to come here. And uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Larry Stevens. I'm on the board of the Maui Maui Marine Resource Council, which is another sponsor of this August event. We've been doing talks about the environment and the ocean for a couple of years now, but this is our first time ever to come to the Maui Ocean Center. So our speaker, Dean Tokishi, is a Maui boy. He, he is the ocean resource specialist with the Kahoolawe Island Reserve Commission. He graduated from Maui High, got a bachelor's degree in marine science from UH Hilo. He, is, he was involved in the Kahoolawe project during the restoration an ordinance removal phase of the project. He's been with the commission since 2003, helping to manage and protect all of these wonderful resources. He's now the Ocean Resources Program Manager, where he works in the education area primarily. Let me uh, ask you to give Dean a warm welcome. Hello, Kako. Good evening, my name is Dean Tokishi. Like um, earlier introduced, I'm from Maui. Um, live in Wailuku now, grew up in Kahului. I've worked for the Kahu'olawe Island Reserve Commission for the last just over 16 years now. And prior to that, for about a little over three years, I worked during the cleanup project on Kahu'olawe, removing ordinance. Um, don't worry, yeah, your math is correct. I started working when I was 10 years old. <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, before we get started tonight, I do also want to give a big thank you out. Thank you out to all of you, first of all, for giving up your time to make the effort to come out here tonight and to learn about Kaho'olawe. Um, secondly, of course, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, thank you guys for extending the invitation and giving us the um, ability to do this tonight. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Amy. And of course, the Maui Ocean Center. Thank you very much for this incredible facility letting, uh, hosting us here tonight. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so tonight, I'm going to be speaking of Kaho'olawe. Um, specifically, there's the rich history of the island, and what it's been through, and the people that have brought it to where we are today, and the work we're continually doing, what we're doing today, why we're doing it, and how it impacts our near shore reef ecosystem, specifically the coral. Um, before I go on, Kukulu Kea Kanaloa, the life and the spirit of Kanaloa builds and takes form. Kanaloa is one of the four main major male deities in Hawaiian belief and religion. Kanaloa is the god of the ocean, everything in the ocean, and especially the wide open navigation, navigating of the ocean. So this is Kanaloa. Kaho'olawe sits in the land division of Honu'ula. So this is a very unique angle. We're looking back towards Kaho'olawe from the east end of Maui. Honu'ula is the district that reside, Kaho'olawe resides in. And I'm sure a lot of you know that land divisions were separated by, by waterways. So on Kaho'olawe, there's, it's a very dry and arid place. And a lot of our, there's no free-flowing streams year-round. There's no springs. A lot of our water we depend upon is seasonal, and it comes in the form of a rain cloud, the Na'ulu rain cloud. And so traditionally, this is how Kaho'olawe got a lot of its water, was from the Na'ulu rain cloud, and it originates in Honu'ula. Kaho'olawe is then further divided into smaller land divisions called Ili. And as we go around, there's Keale Ikahiki, Honoko'a, Ahupu, Kuheia, Kaulana, Papaka, Hakio'ava, Kanapo, and Kunakana'alapa. Somewhere around 1000 AD, was the first um, carbon dating of a human presence on Kaho'olawe. And this was found actually around petroglyph sites. I'm not sure if you can really make that out in this picture, but around petroglyph sites were also left remnants of midden, meaning food scraps, on Kaho'olawe. And around also near on the petroglyph sites were ads quarry, was an ads quarry, and I'll touch upon that a little later. But this is how we have um, markers of about when the first presence was. Then around 1200 AD, there's indications that Kaho'olawe is used as a center for navigation and trade 
navigational training in specific. There's a lot of place names on the island that give us insight to that. Specifically, this place we're looking at right now, Kiala Ikahiki. That name, Kiala Ikahiki, gives us a strong look into why the island and this area might have been used for navigation. Kiala Ikahiki literally translated the pathway to Tahiti. This land division we're talking about is Kiala Ikahiki. The point, specifically right about here, is called Kiala Ikahiki. The channel out here is called Kiala Ikahiki. There's a wind that blows predominantly off this point. Can anyone guess what it's called? <laughs> You're right, Kiala Ikahiki. Have you ever heard the saying, New York was so great they named it twice? Well, Kiala Ikahiki was so great they named it four times. <laughs> Kiala Ikahiki, the pathway to Tahiti. I was very fortunate to be out here one day with um, Okulea navigator, Kaiulani Murphy, and she provided us with some great information, a lot of stories, a lot of molelo. And she said, from her, when they from her I learned, when the Hokulea left from this point, prior to this last trip, the worldwide tour, they left from Kelei Kahiki. Previously, they had leave from Kalai, South Point, Big Island. But when they left from Kelei Kahiki, it was their fastest time. They're able to shave off seven days. Now, seven days on a canoe, is a long time because you know that seven days could be the difference between you looking at that same guy next to you for I don't know how long and you cannot stand him anyone you might throw him off the canoe already so that's huge Kiala Ikahiki what I did want to share also is Kiala Ikahiki sits about right here this is Kaho Olave of course what Kayulani also shared with us which was really interesting is Kiala Ikahiki the pathway to Tahiti but in the Hawaiian language that E in Kiala Ikahiki is directional. So not only does it mean the pathway to Tahiti, it means the pathway from Tahiti, which is really, really interesting in this point right here. If you look at Kaho Olave, and specifically again, this point of Kiala Ikahiki, it is, this is my word, I'm not sure this is even a true word, latitudinally in the center of the Hawaiian island chain. From the very tip of South Point, to the very north point of Hanalei. You're trying to find, if navigating back from the South Pacific, trying to find the Hawaiian Islands, basically 500 miles, trying to find 500 miles of island in the largest thing on our planet, besides the planet itself is the Pacific Ocean. And you're trying to find this needle in a haystack. <laughs> so strategically, what do you do? You aim for the middle of the bullseye. So when sailing from the south and to the east of the Big Island, once the sky and the stars align at a certain way that line up with Kaho Olave and Kele Kahiki, you hang a left. <laughs> and of course, there, there's no GPS, there's no Google, there's no Bixby, there's no Alexa. It's just the sky, the stars, the sun, and the water. Strategically, if you're trying to find this place and you make that left just a little too early, you might be able to hit Big Island. You hit, you're looking for Kiali Kahike and make that left a little too late, at least maybe you'll hit Kauai. So strategically, again, Kiali Kahiki, the pathway to Tahiti and the pathway from Tahiti. Now, I talked a little earlier about its trade. Kaho Olave is used as a trade center. And I also mentioned a little earlier about we found um, carbon dating around petroglyphs. And there were um, midden sites, food sources. But there are also a lot of koa, or shrines even, for an ads quarry, or specifically a koi, they call them. Koi, or ads in Hawaiian. And why the value of this? Why is this so important? Well, it's the second largest ads quarry found in the state, traditional ads quarry found in Hawaii, the largest being at the summit of Mauna Kea. So the quality of basalt that Kaho Olave provided, specifically at a place called Pu'umo'ivi, was found to be of high quality. It flaked well, it edged well, and again, is in the middle of the Hawaiian Islands. So logistically, it was probably very convenient. So you could say if you're from Lahaina, 
or anywhere around there. Paddle out to Kaho Olave, pick up some opihi shells and some other pupu shells maybe along the way, pick up your bento, your plate lunch while you head up to Pumoivi, <laughs> form your koi, be back home to the wife and the kids by evening. Or as opposed to the summit of Mauna Kea, it's quite a different story, the hike, the elevation, the logistical ability to get there. But this quality of basalt proven to be, you know, maybe a not as great grain, but logistically a lot easier. We also know the value of this that it provided, the koi and the basalt. This is a shaped, this is a fully formed shaped koi. And in the 30s, it was found on the Tuamotu atolls. And it was traced back, isotopes, chemical isotopes, were traced back to Kaho Olave. And actually, specifically, I'm not sure how they did it, but to the point of Pumoivi, the summit of Pumoivi, this area. So this gives us insight in a couple of things. One, the value of this koi that it held. And also, it may seem far off or far-fetched to us now, but intra-Pacific travel was happening. It was doubted at one point, believe it or not. I talked to groups, youth groups now, and they can't believe it. I mean, Hokulea has proven that once, twice, 100 times over now. But this is just another form of showing that inter-Pacific travel was happening. Moving along now in time. 1778, Captain Cook, I don't like to say discovered. He stumbled upon the Hawaiian Islands. We were already, the Hawaiian Islands were already here. 1779, his good buddy, his BFF, George Vancouver comes along. And Hawaii's forever changed in many, many ways. I'm sure ways I don't need to point out right now, but specifically to Kaho Olave. Captain Vancouver here introduces goats. He doesn't introduce them specifically to Kaho Olave. They're given as gifts to the king of Maui at the time, Kahikili. Kahikili's looking at these goats and he's like, thanks. Um, I don't know, these are some funky looking horses, but <laughs> thank you. It was a strategic move. I've, did a little, I've done some research, but it's a strategic move and it's done by a lot of the ships. They, wherever they'd go, they'd leave pumpkin seeds, um, animals, um, just food for that if they ever returned that they would be familiar with. So he left goats. Kaikili was like, okay, um, you know what boys, put it on that island over there. <laughs> Pointing to Kaho Olave and Kapu. It's a gift to the king. No one can touch these goats. So the goats start to run, run rampant on Kaho Olave. And if you know anything of how goats feed, biological lawnmowers. Except they don't just cut the top, they'll eat everything down to the root. So over time, Kaho Olave was never ever a lush green rainforest. It was always described as varying arid, a dryland forest, a lot of shrubbery, low-lying grasses. But the goats took care of that and took it to another level, even creating a lot of destruction and taking the vegetation down to what's called a hard pan, where nothing else can grow. Topsoil has been removed because of vegetation loss. So the goats <clears throat> didn't help the environment at all. They were probably the first step of a long chain of things. Well. Other things happening on Kahola, we're going through time, 1824 to 1843. There's a prison colony on, placed on Kahola, specifically at a bay called Kaulana. Now in Hawaiian, Kaulana can have two meanings. They have multiple meanings, but the two most known meanings are Kaulana, the famous, the well-known, the popular. Kaulana, the resting place. Let me tell you this story, and I'll let you decide which meaning you think it follows. So, 1824 to 1843, King Kamehameha I has just passed. His prominent wife, Queen Ka'ahumanu, has a strong influence over Kamehameha II, Liho Liho at this time. And she has taken a strong um, taking to Christianity. And one of the first things she does, actually, is break one of the major kapus of that time, the aikapu, where men and women aren't allowed to feed, eat together. She sits down next to liho liho, and they eat. And that's kind of a signal of times are changing. So a lot of rules and ways of Christianity are taken, into, taken, taken in 
in the Hawaiian culture. Where in the past, you know, if you walk into your neighbor's, say, ulu grove, breadfruit grove, and pick up breadfruit and take it home, now that's thievery, right? Or let's say um, they had multiple partners, where now in Christianity we've learned this adultery is not accepted. So there are these rules that literally almost overnight come into play. Now, where do you put rule breakers? There were no prisons. There was a death sentence, but Christianity tells us that's a little extreme. Well, Kahumano says, well, we'll put the men on Kaho'olave, Kaulana. And we'll put the women on Lana'i. <laughs> Got to keep them separated. The story is, and this is a story taken from newspapers, Hawaiian newspapers. There's a bunch of guys hanging out on Kaho'olawe, Kaulana, this bay, right here. And they're pretty bored. They don't got nothing to do except watch the water. So somebody, let's say Kimo, swims out a willy willy log. And he watches that willy willy log. And every day, that willy willy log is going from this end of Kaho'olawe to this way towards Kealii Kahiki. He's like, I don't want to go to Tahiti. <laughs> so he waits and he watches. And one day, that willy willy log goes this way, towards Maui. So Kimo and um, Alika, <laughs> they walk from Kaulana to a place called Aikupau. They get in the water. Hawaiians were amazing watermen and water people. This seven mile distance was nothing to them. So they swam from here to Molokini, rested a while. From Molokini to Makena. And once at Makena, they caught their breath, uh, obtained some canoes, <laughs> and paddled those canoes from Makena to Ma'alaya, or Kealia is what it says. And there they got some provisions. They, again, obtained some sweet potatoes. Well. They then went from Kealia all the way around to Lahaina. And at this time, Lahaina is the capital of Hawaii. It's bustling. It's happening. Not that it isn't now, but it was really happening back in the day. So Kimo, Alika, and a bunch of their friends, handful of their friends, they, uh, I'm not sure if they ever intended, but um, I'd like to think they were going to repay. But they got a lot of salted pork. They got a lot of alcohol, and the story is one or two more canoes. And then, guess where they went? Right across the channel to Lanai. They picked up a bunch of women, got in the canoes, and again, these are very uh, different times maybe, or different thinking. They went back to Kaulana, where the rest of their friends were waiting for them with the women, with the alcohol, with the food, and apparently it was a huge party. It was a rager for days. It made Burning Man look like a potluck. <laughs> I, I, the, the newspaper didn't say that, I, I put that in. Well, anyway, word, you know, coconut wireless was strong as then as it is now, even without the cell phones, and word gets back to the Sheriff back in Lahaina, <laughs> Sheriff Lindsay, he's in Lahaina, and he's like, hey, Sheriff, these guys, they got some, you know, shady stuff going on there. Maybe you better go check it out. Again, coconut wires is just as strong. Ships are passing by. They're yelling past the prison. He coming, he coming. You guys better do something. They knew who he was. So by the time the officials get to Kaulana, the women are no longer there. There's only about five people left there. There were in 20 something, they say. There's only five, and they're passed out. <laughs> the rest had, they assume, made their way back to Maui as easy as they had done it the first time and just dip, dispersed into the general population. Now I ask you again Kaulana, the famous, the well known, the popular, or Kaulana, the resting place. I like to think it was the famous and well-known because of that party. So the prison colony on Kaho'olawe Kaulana. 
Well, they're ranchy operations. Ranching is booming in Hawaii at this time. The gold rush of California is going off. And cattle needs for food are needed. It's easier, almost easier logistically to ship the cattle and the steaks and the beef to the West Coast from Hawaii than to drive them across the continent. So all over Hawaii, cattle operations are happening, but specifically on Kaho'olawe from 58 to 41. And it goes through multiple leases. And we already got the goats doing damage on Kaho'olawe. Now we have the ungulates trampling the horse, the cattle. They brought sheep. Uh, records also show they had turkeys. I think there still might be some out there because I work with them. But they've had, they had all kinds of cattle um, ranching operations going on, on on the island at this time. So again, more environmental impact happening. Trampling, the feeding, and again, taking the vegetation down, down to the root, so where it no longer can hold any kind of soil. Whenever it rains, runoff. And where does that runoff go straight into the coral reef ecosystem? But I'll get to that. To 1941, the ranching operation happens. 1941, specifically, ranching operations happen until December 8, 1941, because on December 7th, the day that will live in infamy. The US already knew, we already had known that we were gonna be entering the World War, but it just wasn't known exactly when. Well, here it is. So on December 8th, the island, the entire island of Kaho'olawe is taken under martial law. It means the military says, ranchers, you gotta go. We're giving you about 24 hours to get whatever you can and get out of here. Anything left has now become property of the government. And so from December 8th, bombing, practice bombing, bombing practices and artillery and munition practices start occurring on Kaho'olawe to train, to prepare um, our soldiers for World War II. World War II ends, and then the Korean War begins. Korean War ends, Vietnam begins. Vietnam ends, or withdrawals happen. But we now, military still need, uh, our military still needs places to train. And then there's the Middle East conflicts. All this time, munitions are being dropped on Kaho'olawe. And no longer is it just by the United States. It's by all allied forces coming through the Pacific. We've got the UK dropping munitions. We've got Australia, New Zealand, Canada. That's all I got top of my head, but. And it wasn't just from the air. It was from ship to shore, air to ground. Even on ground practices were held. Everything you can name was dropped, shot, f flown, or put onto this island. Every inch of the island, except nuclear and chemical. Everything else was dropped on this island for fif nearly 50 years. And specifically, and talk about training, and specifically in 1965, there's an operation called Sailor's Hat that occurs. And what Sailor's Hat, the naval operation Sailor's Hat is, is they want to know, the military wants to know what effects a nuclear blast, just the acoustic blast, would have on ships and their communication systems on, on the board. So how do they simulate that? They pile up 500 tons of TNT in the form of a dome, and they have ships anchored at different increments offshore with their recording devices. If you actually go onto YouTube and Google, uh, YouTube, Sailor's Hat, Kaho Olave, there are some mind-blowing images. But so they load up the 500 tons of TNT and they blow it. They, it's not done yet. They cover up the hole, they pile up 500 more tons of TNT again and blow it again. They're not done yet. They cover the hole, pile up 500 more tons again of TNT and blow it. And after that last third um, shot, it's not covered. So this is the hole that remains. It's, um, 
it's in a place that we now refer to as Kunihi, but for the longest time it didn't have a name. It was referred to as Sailor's Hat because of that operation. And so you can see how close it is to the shoreline, impacts it probably had to the marine life at the time. So that's the blast. It's, uh, it's pixelated pretty bad because uh, that is from 1965. Someone made a comment earlier, it looks like a Minecraft uh, explosion. <laughs> but yeah, so sailor's hat. Well, this is going on and on January 4th, 1976. So around this time now, in the 70s, Vietnam, well, the US has withdrawn from Vietnam in 75. But also what's happening around the world right now at this time is um, a lot of civil disobedience, they would call it, quote unquote, civil disobedience. A lot of people wanting to make sure that they were heard against the man. Well, it's no different than what was happening here in Hawaii. If, you get, if anyone was here at this time, I'm sure they could attest. Around this time also what's happening in Hawaii is the renaissance, the renaissance, the rebirth of the Hawaiian culture, the language, the music, the arts, the religion, Hokulea is getting its start at this time as well, the voyaging canoe of Hokulea. So it's a time of renaissance, a time of civil change, if you will. So there's a group on Molokai, Hui Alaloa, the Hui Alaloa, made up of great men and women. And they're protesting on Molokai to open up shoreline accesses for cultural use purposes. They didn't believe that they should be denied the right to certain areas. If they wanted to practice their cultural belief, they should have that right. And so similar things are happening all over the state. And then they all get together, minds from all over, because everyone talks in the same community, and they say, you know what? There's an entire island <clears throat> that's being bombed, that's being abused. It needs to stop. In the Hawaiian way of thinking, cultural way of thinking, the island or the land is kupuna, is an elder, is an ancestor. So that, that disgrace to the island is what they felt needed to be stopped. So January 4th, 1976, an armada, if you will, gets together, led by Uncle Charlie Maxwell. Uncle Charlie Maxwell having a direct influence to where we're standing today. He was one of the culture first, he was in fact the cultural practitioner here, the first. And he organizes a group and he says, we're gonna storm the beaches of Kaho'olawe. They're gonna think it's Normandy all over again and they're gonna have to stop the bombing. They're gonna have to listen to us and we'll make our point. They launched from Ma'alaya. And again, coconut wireless, wireless not failing. The boats make it about halfway across the channel to Kaho'olawe and the Coast Guard shows up. Coast Guard in vessels, Coast Guard, in, Coast Guard in helicopters, and they say anyone proceeding any further or stepping foot on that island of Kaho'olawe will be thrown in jail, uh, will confiscate your boats, and you'll have a federal record. Oh, we better rethink this, man. I gotta go work Monday. My wife gonna get mad. Okay, you know what, let's turn around and we'll figure this out again. We'll figure this out later. So they all turn around. <clears throat> all the vessels, all the boats, all the people turn around, except for one boat. One boat carrying the Kaho'olawe nine. Seven men and two women. And they go through, they puka through, they keep going. And they say, you know what, we're going. And they make landfall. And they, this, is, this is the actual pictures. This, back in the day, this is how you had to take a selfie. But this is at Kuhei'ia. This is where the last ranch was, ironically. And they do some ceremony. They, they um, have prayer, <clears throat> they play songs, they actually plant a couple of coconut trees, and they wait. And they know they're gonna get arrested, so they wait. But they do their thing, what they feel is right, to make the point that Kaho'olawe should not be bombed or treated this way. So I recently gave a talk to a group of fourth graders at a um, school here on Maui. And I told them, do you know who Abraham Lincoln is? Oh yeah, yeah, we know Abraham Lincoln, the president stopped slavery. You know who George Washington is? Oh yeah, we know George Washington. He was the first president of the United States. You know Barack Obama? Oh yeah, he's from Hawaii. I said, these names for us in Hawaii, 
are just as important. These are men and women that blazed the trail, that sacrificed and did everything, that got the ball rolling. And of this group of people, brave men and women, that started it all, the group called the, the PKO, the Protect Kaho Olave Ohana started from this grassroots organization, from the grassroots organization of PKO started from this first movement. And if it were not for the PKO and all the efforts that they did and they believed in, I would not be here today, having the job, being able to speak in front of the, all of you. So I'm very, um, very aware and make sure to pay homage to these people um, and this group of people. Real quick, seven, I mean nine made the landing. The Coast Guard came immediately and arrested seven people. Weren't there two more of you guys? No, no, just us, just us. <laughs> Uncle Emmett Aluli and Uncle Walter Reedy, as soon as they hit the island, they went. They hid for, they ran, they went into the bushes. Uncle Walter Reedy was actually the first one off the boat. And um, if anybody, you know, you may not, you don't even have to know Uncle Walter, but you just can know of him and you know his personality. But when I asked him about this, <clears throat> He said, bro, I was so seasick. There's no way I was going to go back to Maui. I might as well go Kaho Lavi. So he said, I was, yeah, that's why I was the first one off the boat. And he tell, suck in Emmett. He followed me into the bushes. <laughs> so Emmett and Uncle Walter, they stayed on Kaho Lavi for actually two more days. Uncle Emmett says the only reason he gave himself up was because he had to finish up, he had a residency, he's currently in the, res, he's doing his residency back on Oahu, he's a, he's a physician, he's a, he's a doctor. So he had to go back, he said, if I didn't go back, there's gonna fire me and all my work would have been gone. But the two of them, I've spoken to both of them, and they said, the island spoke to them that day. There was destruction, there were munitions everywhere, they were scared, they didn't know if they were gonna blow up, they didn't know if they were gonna die, they didn't know if they were gonna live. But they found heiau, which are like um, shrines, religious cultural shrines. They found petroglyphs. They found ulumaika. They found the koi. They found remnants that their ancestors were there and the mark they had left. And they were speaking to them personally still yet. And so when they got back, they were arrested, of course. They got back. They told everyone. The military is telling us Kaholav is worthless. Why do we want it back? Why do we want to stop the bombing? We can tell them. We know what's there. Our ancestors are still there. This is where we can still learn our culture. This is where we can still talk to our gods. So the PKO begins starting their movement to stop the bombing. And they're willing to risk life and limb, literally. So in 77, there's an occupation. Richard Sawyer and Uncle Walter Reedy spend, spend 39 days, the longest occupation of, of th that time, 39 days on island, straight. Well, they're supposed to be back. And so, I'm sorry, the strategy of doing this, being occupying the island, is so that the military has to stop bombing. They'll be dropped off, people will be dropped off on Kaho Olave, and they're... Families would call them and say, hey, you know what? I just dropped off my uncle. I just dropped off my dad. I just dropped off my husband. You guys better stop bombing. They're out there. And they're, oh, my God. So now the military has to stop all activity and look for these people and run around and look for them. And they're not happy about that. So they've, they've done several occupations like that, illegal occupations. But this was the longest, this one in 70, 77, 39 days. And that wasn't originally the plan. Uncle Walter and Richard Sawyer wanted to see how long they could stay out there on their own. Living off of coconut water, following the military, eating their leftover rations and stuff like that. Well, their friends, um, Kimo Mitchell, Walter Reed, and there's actually another Mitchell with them. Three of them go to Kaho Olave to look for them because they're worried. That wasn't the plan for them to stay out there that long. Well, they go out there and <clears throat> they can't find them. They can't find them. So. The plan is, they tell the boat that drops them off, drop us off, meet us back here tomorrow, and take us back, if we, so at least give us one day to look for them. Well, the boat never comes, and the newspaper article says it's because 
they're not sure if foul play was involved or what, but someone had pulled the plug out from the boat in Ma'alaya and the boat sank to the bottom of the harbor. So these three gentlemen, these two plus the other Mitchell, are waiting at Hakeoava. Hakeoava is the northeastern point of Kaho'olawe. And if you know, <clears throat> if you've ever been off of Kihei um, at about 11 o'clock in a.m., just before noon, you know how rough that water can get. It's just white capped and blown and not friendly. So these gentlemen are standing there. And between the three of them, they have two surfboards and one pair of fins. <clears throat> one pair of fins. And again, being great watermen that they were, like their ancestors, being to swim across, um, they say, you know what? Chance them, we go. So the three of them get in the water. The story also is, on the way down to the water, um, George Helms slips and cuts his head pretty bad, and he's bleeding, but they get in the water regardless. And the three of them, they swim, they start going, <clears throat> and then it doesn't take long for them to say, this might not have been a good decision. <laughs> or how I tell my daughters, you make good choices. This may not have been a good choice. So <clears throat> the two of these, the, these two gentlemen are on one surfboard, and they have the fins. They give the fins to the other Mitchell, and they say, go back to Kaho'olawe, get help. We're going to try and make it to Molokini. Go get help. We're going to be waiting at Molokini. So these guys, the other Mitchell makes it back to Kaho'olawe, flags down, waves down the military that's looking for them anyway, and says, you got to help my friends. They're on Molokini waiting for us. They're like, okay, okay. Well, a search party is deployed, but these gentlemen are never found. <clears throat> George Helm is from Moloka'i. At this time, during this time, he is the po'o, or one of the main leaders of the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana. He's also a very famous falsetto singer in Waikiki. So if, if you ever look him up, he has a beautiful falsetto voice. This is um, Kimo Mitchell. His father is Harry Mitchell, Harry Kunihi Mitchell. And he provided a lot of that conductivity from the traditional knowledge to the PKO and how practices should be held, how cultural things should be done, a lot of stories, name, place names. And so because of his dad, we have a lot of traditional information still. But these two gentlemen were lost. And see, they literally were willing and did give their lives for the efforts to stop the bombing on Kaho'olawe. Kimo Mitchell is from KNI. George Helm is from Moloka'i. So these, these two memor their memo this memorial sits in Hakio'ava, the last place they were seen on Kaho'olawe. Kimo, Kimo's memorial faces KNI. George Helm's faces Moloka'i, because that's where they're from. That's where they were um, born and raised. Interestingly, though, I noticed that the passing dates on the two memorials were different. They entered the water at the same time. Kimo says March 9th, George says March 7th. And I asked someone why that was. And the story I was told is that Kimo's father, yeah, Uncle Harry, said my son was an incredible waterman. If he were lost at sea, he would have survived at least two days, I think. So because of that, his passing date is different than George Helms. George Helm and Kimo Mitchell, again, names that I, I really believe we should all know, our children should know, and their children, and their children, and all generations should remember. So when the two gentlemen are lost, the, the military is thinking, this is it. We've broken their back. There's no way they're going to want to continue with the loss of these two great men, one being their leader even. They're not going to continue. And they could have very well been the end of the protect Kaho'olawe Ohana movement. But no, they rallied around that and they said, you know what, we cannot give up for George and Kimo. And to, to this day, I still hear Uncle Emmett recite those, those words. When you think things are getting tough, when you don't like what you're doing, when it's hard on Kaho'olawe, hey, George and Kimo did it. Actually, what it does do is spark a realization that we need to come about this another way, not just this grassroots of occupying the island. So they take it to the courts. They have cultural documentation, a survey done of Kaho'olawe. And in 81, they find that more than 540 archeological sites are documented on the island. It's hard to see, this is not the best picture, I apologize. But this is Hakeo'ava. This is a heiau, what's thought to be either a heiau or some kind of prayer platform. 
reserved for kane, or men. And this one on this side of the ridge is for wahine. You can see the wall stackings, but there's over 540 archaeological sites on Kaholawe. And so it's enough for the entire island to be placed on the National Registry of Historic Places. And they're saying this now gives status equivalent to the Washington Monument, um, Gettysburg, um, the Lincoln Memorial, um, the Vietnam War, hallowed grounds, if you will, for people on the continental US and our legislators to give them some kind of reference to say this island is now equivalent to what you guys believe to be sacred areas. So we need to stop the bombing. No, but bombing continues. So now they're fighting this movement on two fronts. They're still doing illegal occupations. They're still fighting what essentially, legally, essentially is the strongest military force in the world. Well, persistence pays off and a little bit of political jockeying. In 1990, bombing is halted. The first President Bush signs it and the island is returned to the state of Hawaii in 1994. If you're really curious, there's the back story to this is, is very interesting as well. It's a lot of political jockeying that happened. It has to do with, at the time, um, um, Danny Noy and, uh, yeah, Danny Noy and Patsy Mink. Well, in 93, Congress uses, uh, ends military use. Oh, sorry. And $400 million is allocated for clearance of all the bombs. Um, in 2003, the, in 98, in 93, the cleanup starts. In 2003, the cleanup ends. And in 04, the island is transferred to the Kirk in 04. In the 10 years of cleanup, what happens? This is what happens. All this red area has not been cleared of any ordinance. Okay? This uncolored areas have been surface swept. And these green areas have been surface swept and cleared down to four feet so that digging can occur and planting can occur. So you can see the stats here and 100% of the water have not been cleared at all. So there's still a lot of munitions in the water and we see them, they wash up every once in a while. But during this time, this 10 years, the Kaho'olawe cleanup, it's the largest helicopter operation in the world. 400 people are mobilized to this island and working on it to remove all the ordnance. I'm guaranteed everyone in here probably knows someone or knows of someone or knows someone, or knows someone that worked on this project for 10 years. <clears throat> Every day, 300 people were flown back and forth to the island. There are 400 working there. And yeah, this is the clearance project. So once the clearance project stops, <clears throat> when the law is established of what the island and reserve can be used for. First and foremost, all of this, what it comes down to, the island and its surrounding waters are a cultural reserve. And because of that, everything else falls in place. Kaholav is first and foremost a cultural reserve. So all activity and access to the island have to fall under one of these four things. But this is probably one of the most interesting things. No commercial use for the island can be used. <clears throat> so like I said, because the island is first and foremost a cultural reserve, cultural protocol needs to be established. So not only are we going to be just planting, putting Native, ve native vegetation in the ground, but we need to do it in a cultural manner. How do we do that? First, we gotta call back the rains. So, like I told you about that, now Ulu Cloud Bridge is how Kaho Olave used to get its water. That cloud bridge was severed after the goats arrived, after the bombing, after the destruction of the island. And that cloud bridge was severed and Kaho Olave didn't see it, the now Ulu Cloud Bridge. If you look right here, about one third of the island is what we call this hard pan, this red clay, hard pan where nothing can grow. Um, Topsoil could have been up above it or on it. Elevations of much of seven to 10 feet, they believe, of topsoil was lost. And when it's all lost, it's, all that's left is this hard pan. And it's trying to grow something uh, like in a parking lot, equivalent to like the Costco parking lot. So what's the first thing? Well, we need to call back, we need to call back the rains. We need to call back that water source. We need to call back the Naulu Cloud Bridge. How do we do that? Well, this rain koa was first established on Kaho Olave. And what makes this rain koa very unique is there are two kuula stones, two uprights. This one on the left is for Kane, Kane, the god of fresh water. 
the God of um, life. And the one on the right, if you look at it, it looks like a shark fin almost. And that is to pay homage to Kamohoali'i. He's the shark god. He's Pele's elder brother. He's the one responsible for bringing Pele and all their siblings to Hawaii. And his home is right down there off these cliffs. So when this was built, it was to pay homage and to call back the rain clouds, pay homage to Kane and Kamohoali'i. Well, guess what? It started to work. Over time, and it's still, now it's, it's, it's good to see this Na'ulu cloud bridge. Na'ulu meaning literally a column. Or poetically, sometimes ulu is referred to as life as well. So the Na'ulu cloud bridge. And we do things, everything we do now in Kaholawe has a reverence of um, culture to it. Well, we called the rains. <laughs> we got it. Now we've got to plant something because with the loss of all that topsoil, when it rains, it has nothing to hold it. There's no vegetation or nothing to hold that rainwater to let it percolate to recharge that aquifer or the water lens underneath the island. So because of that, we estimate that we lose about 1.9 million tons of soil a year. And so I'm going to really start quickly going through some of the techniques we use. But you see, this is a dry, and as soon as it starts raining, just runoff just, the island literally looks like it's bleeding. So how do we stop that? Yeah. Cheryl, you remember this picture? <laughs> I think Cheryl took this picture. So this day, actually, it wasn't a heavy downpour. It was just a light, steady rain that did this. But again, it's that catchment area of all that hard pan that just funnels all the rain and then mud into our oceans. And so that's the cause and effect that Malcolm Makai relationship on Kaholave is very evident. You can see the plume that's starting to um, yeah, happen here. <clears throat> so what do we do? Oh, I'm sorry. And it's not just rainfall. It's, it's sustained winds that'll blow sediment off the island. Wind transport, lus. I just recently learned this word, lus. But the wind is, the wind is constant. The wind is year round. The wind is every day. The rain is seasonal. So we can plan, we can strategize, but the wind, that sediment be, being blown off is constant. So this is that, a map of that hard pan I was saying. This is a um, satellite map imagery. So this is a hard pan where there is no vegetation happening. And so there's no topsoil. And that's one third of the island. So what's the first thing we need to do? We need to capture that water. We've called the water. Now we need to capture it. So in 2003, a catchment was placed. This is a one acre catchment at the summit of the island. We have three tanks like this, each holding 250,000 gallons of water so we can have irrigation for our plantings. And we had to lay it all out. Actually, volunteers had to help us lay it all out. This is a map. Someone had to walk every one of these irrigation lines. This is the summit of Kaho Olave. This is the east facing bay, facing bay of Kanapo. So the irrigation, drip irrigation system was input. And success was seen. Survival rates prior to drip irrigation went from 5% to 80%. And that's huge. What else? Well, when it does rain, we have geotechs or waddles we set up. So this is up Malka, this is Makai side. When it does rain, some of these geotechs that will absorb and filter some of that water. We don't necessarily want to dam or stop the water. We just want to slow it down and try and take out some of that sediment. These are other um, techniques. In these deep gullies, gabions are put in. So basically, it's cages that are weighted down with rocks, big heavy rocks, and they're put into these gullies. And so when it does rain, it does act as like a um, system to help slow or dam the water, but not, we're not damming it to stop it. We just want to slow it down. And so you can see the sediment is building up behind it. This is a good example. The sediment is building up and it's bare rock here. And vegetation is then planted in those areas. And why are we doing all this? All of this Mauka work is to help the Makai or the near shore coral reef ecosystem. And just some stats on that is, is that the marine managed area of Kaho'olawe extends two nautical miles offshore and it goes around the island, circumferences the island. So it's the largest part of the reserve itself. It's 90 square miles. The island is 45 square miles, so pretty much doubled the island itself is what the water um, marine managed area is. 
And so the reef ecosystem is a huge part of that, obviously. And so this is some of the sediment problem we're dealing with or looking at. See these plumes? This is, this is well after a rain event. But you can see how these plumes just moves down the island. So how do we monitor? First, we need to know what effect or what impact the planting is having, what strategies are working best, what isn't working possibly. Well, we need to monitor that. So we've deployed sediment tubes. So this is off of Hakiowawa again in about <coughs> 27 feet of water. And we've got a series of um, tubes, PVC tubes, and they collect sediment. And it's then filter filtered out. And this is what we've left with. So we're fine. We have a baseline. We know exactly how much sediment is coming off of the island in this place. And it's to then, hopefully in the long term, be able to compare to that 1.9 million tons. That number will go down. If you guys have been on Maui long enough, you remember this, yeah? This is, um, oh man, I remember flying over with Aloha Airlines and seeing this perpetual red ring around Kaho'olawe. The good news is it's not like that as much anymore. But we also found out <clears throat> we need to decipher or differentiate between what is runoff sediment and what is um, resuspension. So this picture on the left, obviously, this is after the rainfall. This water, chocolate waterfall is caused by that rain. But this picture on the right, this is in Kuheia. And this, is not, this color was not added in. This was, the water was so calm for so long, algae had started to grow on, grow on the bottom already. So there's a mat of algae. And we went in and I, I dropped down. This is in about, I don't know, nine feet of water. And just tapped my hand on the surface three times. And this sediment is so fine, so clayous, that it's resuspended again and it restresses the coral. So just like that, that windswept sediment, that the loss, the rainfall, just like onshore, it's seasonal. But this resuspension is, can be caused again by just high surf events, even a large tidal event, we've seen small resuspension happening. So then we need to just differentiate between that. So how do we do that? Sometimes we do some, we do monitoring. We want to monitor the health of our coral reef ecosystem and see what changes are happening over time. Along with the sediment catchment or the sediment traps, we want to monitor the coral health itself. And it's not always just <clears throat> the sediment from the island that's um, causing stress to our islands. If there, there are other external factors, not just the island stresses itself, but global events like um, the bleaching, coral bleaching. And I'm sure you guys are all pretty familiar with this. This is. Um, these are pictures that were taken uh, post-2015, where that summer was a really warm summer and we had bleaching like everywhere else. This is a picture of a healthy mandrina or um, cauliflower coral, and this is a bleacher stressed out because the water just got so warm, it stressed the coral out so bad. And so this picture is 2014. We also do photo plots, and so we can revisit the same sites with these markers, put down the same quadrat, and monitor coral health change over time. So this is 2014. This is 2016. This head is this head. It, it just got so stressed. Um, I guess the good news is it looks like this, uh, this um, finger coral or low coral seems to be doing OK. So it's a little more resilient. This uh, coral grew. You can see it's not here, but here it's starting to fill in a little bit. So these are just some of the monitor te moder monitoring techniques we're doing in the water to see what changes are happening. Another thing. And again, not necessarily on island or local, but it's the um, marine debris. And I'm sure, again, I don't need to explain to in depth the threats that this um, derelict fishing gear, one-time use, one -time use plastics have. Um, this is a net that got caught up, but it's not a great picture. But what the net we found is, if we don't respond to it fast enough, this sweeping action just starts taking out all coral around it. So it's not just what we control on Kaho'olawe, like planting to stop the sediment, but there are a lot of external factors that are affecting our nearshore environment. But I don't, didn't want to leave on a note of uh, sadness. Although Kaho'olawe, <laughs> although Kaho'olawe has a lot of areas where sediment is bad and the corals are stressed and there is coral bleaching happening and we got marine debris impacting because of the respect we still have and that locals and fishermen 
and communities have, and knowing that it is a cultural reserve and therefore it is a marine managed area, there still is a lot of areas of Kaho Olave that are like this, are pristine, or somewhat pristine. And not everyone can go to Kaho Olave to dive, so I wanted to bring a little bit of the dive to you guys. This is a project we did two years ago with Scripps Institute, <clears throat> and they um, got some photo imagery, 3D imagery um, for us. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that was um, purposefully done. I don't know if you heard the comment was, there's, the, there's no fish, or where's the fish? They were um, taken out. This is a public um, resource, so we did not want to advertise fish abundance or fish biomass or fish diversity in areas. These uh, squares are just um, for scale and also so that they can have um, revisit sites. So this was done two years ago and what this does aside from give aesthetic coolness, um, this Scripps Institute will be coming back again this year and uh, doing the same project at the same place and doing the same route. So again, we can monitor coral health change over time and have it in this medium of, um, of format, yeah. For scale, to prov it's a meter, yeah. But to me also, this is why we do it. This gets me a little choked up. Hanauna, Hanauna, it's generational. What's to come? your lineage, that's why we do it. This job that we're doing now, the restoration of Kaho Olave, is not gonna be done in my generation. Truthfully, it won't probably be done in my children's generation. It's gonna take generations. But that's why we're doing it. We're doing it for them. Just like the rightful owners, these are the rightful owners, the next generation, and we wanna give it back to them in a better way we got it, with information. <clears throat> This is Paul Higashino. These are his two sons, Li Hao and Kavelu. And Paul is by far our most senior member. He is our restoration manager. He is responsible for stopping all sediment from going into the island, for planting every tree on Kaholave, every grass, every shrub, to, from turning this hard pan into vegetated area. That's his job. Pretty daunting job. But he's been doing it for nearly 25 years. These are his children. Like I said, it's generational. This is hard pan, nothing can grow. It's dark on the horizon. There's clouds coming, it's gonna be rough. It's gonna be hard, the island's gonna bleed. But without that rain, we can't have life. We need that rain. We gotta do it for the next generation. Anauna. That's all I got. Thank you guys very much. Great job, team. Thank you.